Hi, everyone. I'm Mary. I'm a software engineer on infrastructure team at Chronosphere. And today I want to tell you about how we use Temporal at Chronosphere. If you haven't heard about Chronosphere before, we are a hosted observability platform. We offer metrics and distributed tracing to our clients. And we are built to handle uh, big scale and large complexity of cloud native metrics. Uh, we are powered by M3DBs. It was developed and uh, battle tested at scale at Uber. And we have an awesome engineering team. We've been using Temporal since late 2020. We run it on our own. We run it with MySQL and without Elasticsearch. And most of our uh, development is in Goland, so we're using Go SDK. And we deploy, uh, have a separate Temporal deployed in each cluster that we support. We have three main use cases for using Temporal at the moment. First one is a deployment system. We build our own in-house deployment system for rolling out our software to production. And another use case, we automated a lot of cluster operations such as uh, rolling restarts or draining node pools and performing a lot of other infra-related tasks uh, using Temporal. And the third use case that we have is uh, release validation. We wrote a bunch of uh, scenario tests that we run on our software before making sure that we can roll it out to production. So for the rest of this presentation, I want to focus a little bit more on the deployment system and on the patterns that we developed while working more with Temporal. Some of them we used across all of our use cases, but more of them are related to our deployment system. So a high level overview how, how we do deployment. Um, we run a separate Chronosphere stack uh, for each tenant that we have. And our stack consists of uh, a lot of stateless and stateful services. So each time an engineer needs to roll out changes to production, they usually need to deploy changes to some subset of the services to some subset of the tenants. And at first, when we were small, much smaller, we just had one CLI command to basically generate all the uh, configs for all the services, list it out, and then all the monitoring or making decision whether we need to roll back or performing rollbacks or keeping track of the progress of the work of the rollout. Everything was done manually. And fairly early on, we figured out that this is not gonna scale and this is really inconvenient to use as we grow. So we started uh, looking into a better solution. We checked out different existing solutions uh, for rolling out software to production. None of the existing systems that we could use did, seem to fit our use case very well. So we decided to build our own using Temporal, especially given that we started using Temporal previously for release validation, we already had it ready. So we just decided to automate it. So we've structured our workflows. We have a, a top level orchestration workflow, uh, which basically controls the speed of the rollout across tenants, how many tenants you can roll out at once in which order they should be rolled out. And then, each of the deployment tenant workflows uh, controls the same, but across services in which order the services should be rolled out, should they be rolled out in parallel or sequentially. And uh, tenant workflow basically kicks off underlying deploy service workflows and performs additional monitoring and figuring out is the deployment going as expected or did something bad happen and we need to notify the user or roll back automatically. All of these workflows interact through with additional external dependencies such as Kubernetes, M3DB operator, object storage, Slack, and a lot of others. So one of the first problems that we needed to solve as we were building this out is uh, performing conflict resolution. At first, we decided to do it very simple and very easy. We decided that we just don't want to allow more than one running deploy tenant workflow at a time. And the way we did it, we used uh, uh, workflow IDs for that. Basically, we generated IDs in a way that we could en ensure that only one tenant level workflow can be running at a time. It worked fairly well at first, but then we had more services, more engineers, more changes being shipped to production. And soon enough, uh, it became apparent that we need to allow deploying different services to the same tenant in parallel by different people, by different deploys, but we still should block multiple deploys of the same service for the same tenant. And also as we started automating additional 
uh, cluster operations, we needed to make sure that we don't make changes to the tenant from some other operations. For example, we don't do restores together with deploys, so they wouldn't interact in any weird way. So um, as a result, we realized that we need to introduce a concept of a log for a service. And at the beginning of the tenant level workflow, we need to try acquiring logs for all the services that we want to change. If we succeeded, then we proceed with applying changes. If no, then the workflow will bail out. We implemented it uh, based on the mute example that was provided by Jumporal, and it worked out fairly well. A bunch of things that we needed to add for it. Uh, if you terminate the workflow that initiated uh, the log, then the log would still stay open. So we just needed to implement additional logic for handling in that case. And then we also uh, added uh, a query for the workflow that represents a mutex with information about who called it. And it helped us uh, improve the biggability of this login logic immensely because in case something doesn't work as expected, you can always quickly find which other workflow acquired the log and dive deeper from there. Another pattern that emerged for us is the need to perform additional safety checks as we do rollouts. And the way that we implemented it is uh, we introduced a lot of different activities. Uh, each of them is a specific check. For example, are any critical alerts firing? Is a rollout done? Is a spot available? And then we have additional helper functions that are executed in the context of the workflow that executes those checks in parallel with other workflow changes happening. For example, while monitoring errors, a helper accepts a set of checks that need to be executed periodically, and then a workflow code that should be executed unless one of the check fails. If something fails, then uh, all the other checks should be canceled and the workflow should be terminated. Another helper that was useful for us is wait for all to pass. For example, let's say you applied your changes to your service and then you need to wait until all of them are deployed. So that's the way we, we use that helper. The problems that we have with it, uh, because uh, we were fairly new users of Temporal at the time, we just implemented this calling of activity in a loop. So if you have a lot of checks or you have a long running workflow and you need to execute them fairly fast, then suddenly you can hit the limits on the uh, size of the workflow history. Uh, right now we are not really hitting it, but we still have a plan to kind of rewrite it as a long running activity with hard bits, which is a better approach for this. Um, but still, even with this implementation, it was really, really helpful. And we've been using it across all of our workflows, including release validation and cluster operations. Another thing that we used quite a lot, uh, specifically for our deployment workflows, quite often we, need, we still need to involve a person in the deployment process. There could be multiple reasons for it. For example, something went wrong and you're not sure whether you want to roll back or, or just uh, perform some other action. Or if uh, an engineer is rolling out a more sensitive change and they want to have a little bit more control over the speed of the rollout, maybe deploy to a canary tenant first, perform some validations and only then proceed to the next set of tenants. So for that, we build a Slack application and integrated our temporal workflows with it. So here you can see an example of how one of this confirmation messages looks in Slack. But let's dive deeper into how it works. Basically, the user starts a workflow, and at some point, the workflow reaches a point that we need to ask for user's confirmation about something. We have an activity for that. The activity forms a Slack message and encodes an activity token inside of that message. And the uh, activity doesn't exit as usual. It just returns error result pending, which means that activity will not be marked as completed. Afterwards, the message gets to Slack, and the user sees the message and makes a choice, clicks one of the buttons, uh, with one of the options they want to select. And as a result, the choice that user made and the activity token will be encoded in the payload that Slack then propagates to our application again. Then we decode the activity token and the response and use temporal client to complete the activity using this data. This uh, flow was really useful for us and I think we're going to keep on using it in the future. Right now we're moving a lot of other things into UI for our deployment system, but I think interactions in Slack are still gonna stay with us because they turned out to be really useful and convenient. 
Another interesting problem that we ran into while working on this uh, automating of deploys is the need to pass large or sensitive payloads to workloads and activities. Uh, because deployment manifests that we need to further propagate to Kubernetes or some other system, they, first of all, can contain secrets, so we don't want them to be stored in the history of the workflows. And they can also be quite big in size, which can also hit some unexpected limits. So as a solution, we encrypt the manifest and save them to object storage. And instead of passing the payload into the activity or workflow, we just pass the path to that object. And then our activities just use some common library code to basically fetch the object, decode it, and then proceed with the actions that needed to be performed. And if one thing that could be useful uh, for us if some sort of support for this was available in Temporal and SDK in the future. So as we worked on Temporal, I think we learned a lot of lessons, but to summarize them, the first one is pretty obvious, I guess, for everyone version and is really important as you roll out changes to your workflows. One of the reasons why it's a little bit more important for us, we use uh, queries uh, on the workflows in order to get the status of the workflow in, even after it completed. So we query closed workflows a lot and we store those workflows for a month. So we need to make sure that as we roll out changes, we don't break the replay of the history of them. And one of the things that we've been talking to Temporal team about that could eventually help us a little bit with that, and make it a bit, a bit less painful with versioning if uh, the result of the query for closed workloads was cached after the workflow completes. And another lesson that we learned that you need to be aware of the history size limits. And basically, as you design your workloads, you need to um, think about how is it going to evolve over time and whether you can suddenly start hitting those limits. So thank you, that's everything I had for you today. And in case this kind of problem sounds interesting to you and you wanna find out more about open roles in Chronosphere, you can find them at this link.